own game plans. And the reason this will be true is because the J's are the respected and the trusted proactive health solution of the future. This is the health systems, both the payers and the providers, it's the doctors, it's to employers. It is to the entire community because of the engagement and the outcomes that happen at the Y. When I was at uh, the JCC San Francisco, Laura Greenfield had this beautiful, small, warm event. And I remember her, halfway through dinner, looking me in the eye and she said, this is a healing place. And it was absolutely beautiful and part of the inspiration but we also need to know that it's only a healing place if we provide individualized game plans for people and not, again, a small select people, but access to all that let them lead their best lives. That allows us to meet them where they're at and be part of their journey, both inside and outside your J walls. And that's unbelievably important because we need to get outside our walls in the next hundred years and we need to permeate into their homes and into their lives. And the reason that I say the J's give me hope is because when we talk about JCC's community centers, community centers here is not just about what happens inside this wall or even with inside this Jewish community. It is about standing for this approach moving forward that affects the entire community and these communities together will help us make the world a better place. Thank you. Fantastic. That guy's like having four shots of espresso, isn't it? I was actually thinking about getting up here and flexing right after Mark was done, but that would be humiliating at this point. Um, hey, are there any Marin's teen fellows in the house? Where are you guys? Mark, Mark, Mark Moscardino, you got mentioned, so you're in. It's all good. Thank you for the tweet. Uh, Twitter is actually starting to speed up, so that's good. Take your phones out and tweet in between. JCCs are a nexus. JCCs are a place where people connect. You need a game plan. Get your committee, your group together when it's over and decide what's your game plan from visiting here. There are so many takeaways from each of these things that you have to be able to do things with intentionality. You know, when we were in uh, Arizona before, we listened as Mark told us the difference for Exos Metafit, my walk away was, the rest of the world can figure out how to maybe fuel. The rest of the world has even figured out how to work out. But what they're exceptional at is recovery. And then he taunted us by saying, how many of you execs are gonna leave here and get on a plane and fly home because you have an eight o'clock meeting at your JCC the next morning. And I said, no, I have one at seven. And, and it was true that here we were in Arizona and we didn't even take a day to recover. And so we have to ask ourselves, yes, the speed of change is moving really fast, but do we have to get into the run lane? Is the future of our JCCs the intentionality of picking the walk lane or the rocking chair, of doing something with intentionality to recover and know that the best game plan we have is inside us if we slow down. So thank you for that great teaching. I'm really excited to welcome up to the stage on behalf of all of the culture and the arts and how it plays a part of our JCCs, Susan Engel, the director and producer of 92Y Talks. Hello, good morning. It means so much to me that I'm here with you. I have the greatest admiration for everyone's work. And I'm going to start with an embarrassing picture as well. <laughs> Truly embarrassing. This was taken shortly after I began my work at 92nd Street Y at the age of 22, sometime in the year 1982. As you can see, I had the best high-tech devices of the time, a phone and a Rolodex. Back then, I would not have dreamed that someday our modest lecture series would grow to be 92nd Street Y Talks, now over 250 events a year, more than 60,000 tickets sold, and online views in the millions. So much has changed and is changing in our fast-paced world. What I want to share with you today are four factors that have shaped 92nd Street Y Talks 
that I believe will still be relevant 100 years from now. These are inspiration, relationship building, whoops, okay, we'll go to inspiration, tenacity, and tech but is plus values. First, inspiration. For me, that inspiration began with my father. He was one of us, a JCC worker who encouraged me to enter the JCC field. As the child of Polish Jewish immigrants who saw his entire extended family wiped out by the Holocaust, he felt it his personal privilege and professional responsibility to promote a proud sense of Jewish peoplehood. It was really different then. I grew up hearing about the JWB. I grew up hearing stories about Jewish kids who were poor and whose only chance for a better life was the JCC and JCC summer camp on scholarship. My dad's work was all about passing on the torch, the door of the door, from generation to generation, was his favorite saying. When he passed away, two former counselors saw his obituary in the New York Times. They met at the camp he directed and later married. Retired now with grown children and grandchildren, they came to our shiva to pay their respects. My mother hadn't seen them in almost 60 years. They wanted to credit my dad and the camp with their meeting and with the spark that began their Jewish journey. Fast forward 60 plus years, amazing, we still have that same desire to connect the individual with the community, which is what we all do, and pay forward what has been given to us. What inspires us? Consider these examples from 92nd Street Y Talks. Dr. Ruth, can't do a J talk without invoking Dr. Ruth, tells her story of being sent on the kinder transport to Switzerland, never to see her parents again. When asked what accounts for her resilience, she immediately talks about her warm and loving home, parents and grandmother, as Kathy had mentioned, during the first five years of her life that was so crucial. The father of Malala, the Pakistani girl who was savagely attacked by the Taliban, when asked on our stage where his daughter's strength comes from, says he refused to clip her wings but let her fly. And Bill Gates has an honest Father's Day dialogue with his father, Bill Gates Sr., about passing on the family philanthropic values. Patrons love our talk so much because they are unscripted, unrehearsed, and unaffected. I tried, but it's not easy. This is my, I introduce speakers all the time, but this is my first time doing a speech myself. The word commonly used to describe 92nd Street Y Talks is intimacy, as if you were sitting in a well-known person's living room hearing them reveal their most precious thoughts. This all comes from relationship building which allows for the trust to develop so that whoever goes on our stage feels comfortable telling about what they, who they really are, the person behind the persona, and sharing even their vulnerabilities. It's almost like that aha moment that we've all had when we've seen someone that really inspires us, where we forget about all the annoyances of the day and really are in that moment. Relationship building. Well, you, know, you all know relationship building. There was a slide, but that's okay. 25 years ago, I couldn't sleep and saw Charlie Rose on his 2 a.m. talk show. Back then, no one really knew who he was. How many of you watched CBS Nightwatch? 
back in as I told you. I thought he was terrific, so I invited him to come from Washington to speak on the art of conversation. When he moved to New York with his own popular PBS show, he never forgot us and brought us people like Henry Kissinger, Kevin Spacey, Nancy Reagan. He even interviewed Shimon Peres on our stage, then put it on his show, which reached nine million people. Our relationship continues to this day. Just last week, he hosted a discussion on our stage on election 2016. Charlie Rose is a very busy man, but no matter how busy he is, he loves coming to the 92nd Street Y because he can't get enough of the live experience. 30 years ago, one of our a film professor at Columbia University began our popular film series of film screenings and discussions with talent. This began in a small venue and then quickly moved to our large hall and we started to have film artists on their way to the Oscars, to winning the Oscars. In the fall, this past fall, we had Brie Larson uh, and Meryl Streep is coming up. We're very excited in, in a few months. People come for this series because of our moderator. We have the relationship with the moderator, but the talent has the relationship with the moderator as well and really respects them. So again, they feel comfortable revealing who they are. One of the biggest donors to 92nd Street Y chose to endow our talks because he too loves the live experience and loves meeting and introducing our speakers. We love that he takes such an active role and are delighted with his generosity and commitment. Now for tenacity, which is timeless. For years I tried getting Larry David to our stage. No luck. I kept calling his office. Then I thought, who might know him? The comedian Susie Essman was a frequent guest, so I asked her to ask him. It worked. He came back three times, once with the entire cast of Curb Your Enthusiasm for a season launch. Now that was a tremendous night at 92nd Street Y. Last but not least, tech plus values. How to fuse these is perhaps our biggest challenge ahead. Technology has allowed us to enhance and expand our communications in incredible ways. We've held a town hall via Skype with a community center in Israel. Many of you know we broadcast our talks to JCCs all around the country and created a vibrant online community from our talks postings on our on-demand site, many of which have hundreds of thousands of views. Yet too often we email over picking up the phone or look more at our devices than at each other. Don't get me wrong, as a parent, I could not have survived this year without FaceTime when my daughter was studying abroad. But I also know that the hug she gave me when she walked off that plane was so much more blissful. That's real, irreplaceable, and fundamental to who we are and our humanity. The same is true for the live experience with its palpable energy and the shared experience that sometimes ends with a standing ovation. Technology can spread our message, but it must never become the message itself. Are we having the talks that speak to our values? Are we encouraging, as our JCCA principle states, people to live lives of meaning and purpose? Can we increase our human capacity to go deeper into our message and at the same time take advantage of technology's ability to reach wide? Finally, 
Will we remain as committed to live civil and civic discourse as we are to acquiring the latest technological tools? I urge us to ask these questions as we navigate our new world. 100 years from now, someone will be here in my place holding up a smartphone, pretend, which will appear as outdated as the Rolodex does today. But what I hope we will always recognize is the Nefesh Yehudi it's my father, George Weiss Fuse, with his broad smile reflecting 3,000 years of Jewish history and beaming right, brightly into the future. I dedicate this J Talk to you, Dad. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I think Susan needed a hug. You know, what you just said to us is so true, you have to be here to watch any one of us dedicate something to our parents who aren't in the room. It has to be live, you have to be here. Robin text, uh, uh, tweets out to us, technology can spread the message, but it can't become the message itself, as proven by the screen to my right. <laughs> it's not an insult, it's a fact. It's really true. If we don't become nimble, if we don't catch up with the speed of what happens in our lives, then we stand up here and freeze. We can't. Kathy did such a great job of continuing her talk. This is a lesson for us to learn. You can have the best game plan, but sometimes it goes a different way. Inspiration, relationships, tenacity, tech, and values, it's the future. It's the live experience. The 92nd Street Y tells us we have to dream big. Otherwise, you can't get Susie Essman to drop the F-bomb 143 times from your stage in six minutes. She did it in Milwaukee. It was awesome. I've never heard that get dropped. That, and one of them was actually right at me. It was aw But if you don't dream big, you don't get cussed out by Susie Essman in front of your whole community. You have to be willing, and this is really it, it's about the relationships. And they go back to our own parents, who if you're not here for that live experience, it's not a part of it. Those live experiences happen every day when people walk inside our JCCs, when we greet them, when we say goodbye to them on their way out the door, when we're a part of their lives. We become that nexus, it's the live experience. And talking about live experiences, I wouldn't be standing on this stage right now if it weren't for Jewish camping. The hub of Jewish camping, especially day camping, is the JCCs of North America. We serve more kids in day camps than any other movement throughout North America. And here to talk about the next hundred years is Andy Pritikin. Yeah, give it up. There's no question. That's all for you, Andy. The president of the New York and New Jersey American Camping Association, Andy Pritikin. Thanks so much, Mark. Susie Essman, f bomb you. So impressive. So impressive. So I am a camp director, a youth, a youth development professional, right? And yet, pretty much every day of my life, I am asked the same question over and over. What do I do the rest of the year? <laughs> I, I hang out in a hammock and I, a nice cold drink. Right? Well, I'll tell you what I've been doing for the last week. Speaking to parents, giving tours, re-enrolling campers, enrolling new ones, uh, working on my budget, designing art, advertising and marketing, hiring and training staff, thinking up and executing new ideas, managing my facility, I, building a septic system this year, negotiating with contractors, planning programs, redesigning my website, purchasing new equipment, applying for zoning and construction regulations with the township. Oh, that's joyous. Um, planning and executing reunions, running open houses, attending conferences and workshops, writing uh, newsletters and uh, magazine articles 
sending out press releases, engaging posts, engaging posts on social media. Never thought I'd have to do that. Visiting other camps, networking with local business leaders, creating relationships with schools, synagogues, after school programs, HR departments of corporations, reading up on the latest youth development research and trends, and desperately trying to stay current with pop culture, because that's important as a camp director, right? Um, I'm a community leader in my town. And I feel like a day camp director should be able to run for mayor in their town, right? So a little history on uh, the uh, summer camp professional. So around the Depression, you know, there was a big um, immigration on the Lower East Side of Manhattan for Jewish families. There was 10 people in an apartment sometimes. And the summers got very, very hot. And there was disease. So a lot of lucky people, they, they shipped their kids out, and a lot of times with the moms at that point, out into the Catskills, to bungalows. And that really sort of became the first private camps out there. Um, and uh, camp directors, which then evolved, pretty much for the next 50 years were teachers' side jobs. Right? I'm a camp director in the summer, right? But then in the 90s, when um, camps started selling for millions of dollars, and they started raising tuitions, and then the next thing you know, there's year-round camp staff, and then, then a, a medium-sized day camp could have two, three, four full-time staff, right? We became camp professionals, right? And we've learned that successful camps invest in their leadership the same way that businesses do, because your camp is a business. Right? And during this time, the world has evolved also, right? Neighborhoods have changed. Streets and backyards are empty. Nobody's outside, right? Kids are inside. They're sitting in the central air. YouTube and Snapchat and Instagram and all that stuff. You know, in the winter, I go out and I'm, I'm shoveling snow. I don't see any snowmen being built. When was the last time your car was hit by a snowball? Think about it, right? I cannot remember. It, it might be 20 years. It's, it's crazy, right? Kids are inside, all right? They're suffering from what we call nature deficit disorder now, right? They're in the central air. They're with their parents. They're on screens. You could hit the slide, Chris. Um, they're spending an average of 7.5 hours per day staring at screens, right? Between TV, smartphones, tablets, computers. And, and the good school districts, like good school districts, they say, hey, Let's get them all laptops. Let's get them all tablets because they don't sit in front of screens enough when they're home. And parents acknowledge that there's a problem, but yet most of them don't have the discipline to do anything about it. They only see their kids for a couple hours. They don't want to be busting their chops all night, right? Technology is a drug, and we parents are the drug dealers. <laughs> and as a result, <clears throat> We're unprepared. We're, we're, we're raising a generation that's not prepared for life. Did you guys know that 55% of kids that go off to four-year colleges graduate? 55% graduate within six years. Okay, We're the number one country for sending kids off to colleges and universities, and we're the last place amongst first world countries in graduation rates. The, and also, businesses nowadays, they're saying that there's a talent crisis. They're bringing in A students, 4.0s, valedictorians, they're bringing them into these corporations and the companies are saying they're not prepared, right? The Partnership for 21st Century Learning, uh, p21.org, you should check them out. They surveyed the HR departments of top corporations around the world, right? Google, Verizon, Apple, Disney, Lego. Right? And that's the information that they came up with. So they said, what are you looking for for your new recruits? What skills? And it's not reading, writing, and arithmetic. Right? It's not the three R's. It is now the four C's. Communication, collaboration, critical thinking, creativity. Great communicators with these things, not with these things. Right? They call them 21st century skills, the knowledge, skills, and attitudes necessary to be competitive in the 21st century workforce. And they also asked, they also asked these companies, they said, what, is the num what are you lacking most from people that are coming in? What's lacking most? And across the board, number one by far, they said leadership is lacking. That kids nowadays, they're content to be a cog in the wheel and not steer in the wheel. Right? It's especially bad with guys. Right? You know, the, I think it's like 80%, 85% of the uh, National Honor Society is female nowadays. 
right? Guys, they just want to have their baseball cap backwards and run around and play with the kids. And the girls come up to me and they're like, I want your job at camp. Right? <clears throat> so let's talk about camp. So, you know, day camp was considered for many years glorified babysitting, right? Um, it's sort of a holding tank before kids went off to sleepaway camp. But, as Mark said, now day camp's a big deal. And it's being recognized by the FJC, the Foundation of Jewish Camping, the JCCA, lots of grant writers, all right? They're realizing the potential here. And to, uh, to get onto Kathy's slide about family engagement, which, by the way, camp was not on that list of 500 things, okay? Day camp can be a pivot point for family engagement, a big time pivot point, right? Because if your kid goes off to camp, a, a family that's mar marginally engaged sends their kids off to Jewish day camp and they come home learning about Jewish culture, speaking a little Hebrew, not in Hebrew school, how could it not be important, right? How could it not work? <clears throat> uh, and, and the fact is Jewish day camps should have an advantage over their private camp competitors like me. Right? Because you think about it, they're nonprofit, they should be able to charge less. Plus you've got the Jewish element, so then why not? Right? Why are they going off to the private camps? Well, there's a, per, there's a PR issue. Right? It's a perceived quality issue. Because despite the JCC connection, the Jewishness and all that, it, parents want what's best for their kids. Right? And they're going to send it to the place that they feel is the best. So we're going to talk about, moving towards the future now, um, what are some of these things. And the number one thing we're going to start with is who? Staff. Leadership. Full-time staff. Enough staff. Unencumbered by other job roles. Okay, not just also doing the uh, after-school program and lifeguarding at 2 o'clock and all these different things, right? People dedicated to camp. Most private camps don't have the back office that JCCs have, but they have dedicated people to camp. Right now, if someone called your JCC interested in your day camp, who's answering the phone? Is it a camp professional? Is it someone that can really talk camp? All right? There's also a leadership crisis going on in the Jewish camping world. Most of the best people that I have met in Jewish camping don't work at camps. They're consultants, they're executives, they work for the FJC, the JCCA. All right, why is that? Well, maybe because they want to get paid. Maybe it's because they want to make a living, seriously, right? They should be paid competitively, right? You know, I, I, I feel personally that a camp director should make at least as much money as a teacher makes right? That's on par with them. Well, do you know what the average salary for a starting teacher in America is right now? It's $55,000 for a starting salary, and they work 10 months a year, all right? Many of them end up making about $100,000. How much do your, your day camp directors make? We also need to train them. Professional development, becoming an American Camp Association accredited camp, and going off to the conferences right up the road, about two hours north, the Tri-State Camp Conference, the largest gathering of camp professionals in the world every single year. We learn about new trends, child psychology, public speaking, programming, right? There's so much to learn. So commit to the who to get the pipeline of Jewish camp professionals truly flowing again. Next up, facility. There is a perception of inferior facility. We need to invest in our facility. It's a big reason why families choose private camps. A former JCC camp director, he knew I was coming here today, he said, I want you to ask them. I want you to ask how much have they invested in their camp facilities in their last five years versus how much have they invested in their health spas and their fitness centers, right? And yet, everybody tells me, oh, the camp is it's, it's a huge moneymaker for the JCC. It's a big deal. But yet, we got these like million-dollar fitness facilities, right? So if you have a facility, you need to make it good too. Right? 12 months a year for tours, painted buildings, new, road, new, new roofs, paved and manicured walkways, fences that look like the fences in the backyards of these neighborhoods you're pulling the kids from. Right? Because if you take care of your facilities, parents will think you're going to take care of your campers. And people say, well, it's rustic. Well, rustic is a subjective term. I don't think that rustic should involve actual rust. <laughs> so, so moving on to customer service. So day camp is more than babysitting, right? And more than daycare, but 
it is babysitting and daycare too. And it should be the best that money can buy. We should be exceeding expectations with outstanding customer service across the board. Not, well, we've always done it that way. And I'm sorry, but this is our policy, right? At my camp, nobody's allowed to say no except me. Okay? Because we treat our families like customers. All right? So why do private camps generally do this better? Well, I think it's because somebody's ass is actually on the line. Somebody's paying down a mortgage, right? Pay is based on success and failure. If I used to be a school teacher, all right? A tenured school teacher. If you stink, you still get paid the same as if you're great. All right? That's not what your camp should be like. All right? You're competing with private camps that have a Disney culture where exceeding expectations is the norm. So you need to create serious guidelines, checklists, high standards, and you need to be willing to kick the longtime staff off the bus if they ain't doing to, what should be on the bus, like uh, Jim Collins says. Okay. <clears throat> and the last thing is reframing the message of what we call camp. Camp day camp even, okay, is an educational environment where kids learn the skills of life that they aren't learning in the classroom, that are essential to becoming successful in college, in careers, and in life. And quality camp programs are teaching these skills intentionally, character skills, soft skills, applied skills, which by the way, are the same as traditional Jewish values. Right? And staff, your staff isn't just running after campers. You know what they're doing? They are doing legitimate workforce development. They are learning the skills of life. Right? Talk, remember those top four? Creativity, critical thinking, communication, collaboration. Anyone here been a camp counselor? Would you agree that those are skills that you learn hands on? I was a business major in college. I took management in college and I laughed because I learned more in one summer managing 15 campers than I did in 10 management courses in college, right? So this kind of language creates a value proposition that can be articulated to families who never attended camp. It creates a basis of case statement to funders, and it's a call to action to government regulators. But this is not easy, it's a commitment, right? I heard that there was someone on stage yesterday who said, what would you do with an extra $50,000, okay? Give it to your camp directors, okay? <clears throat> Raise the bar, all right? Keep good people. Right? Have good customer service, invest in your facilities, right? Because what brought us here today, the last hundred years of camping, this will not be what takes you to the next level. If you want your camps to flourish in the 21st century and truly compete with the private camps out there, you need to raise the bar, professionalize your day camp programs, and treat camp like a year-round commitment. Thank you very much. I, uh, I just switched Andy to decaf. Um, wow. I didn't think anybody could, like, you know, get you more up than Mark Verstegen. Sorry, but wow. Um, Anna tweets in, technology is a drug, and we the parents, as we've always known, are drug dealers. Um, it's really true. It's about the fact that we have to find that balance. In one part of our J Talk, we talk about the speed of change, then we talk about the need to connect with technology, and then we talk about the need to disconnect from technology. Um, yeah, I get that it's a mixed message, but life is a mixed message. Running a JCC is a mixed message. When we do that many different things, we have to find that balance. Betsy tweets in, J Camps prepare you for life. The four C's, communication, collaboration, creativity, and critical thinking. We need to get the business world. How many of you around here are sitting on boards of directors because you run a business? This is the interactive part, you actually raise your hand, right? So let's make a new uh, motivation for ourselves. Stop having the belief that you're gonna hire the kid who took an internship working at IBM getting coffee for people. Hire people who work at camps. They will make a difference in your life. <laughs> JCC's figured it out, you need to figure it out too. It's an amazing speech. Thank you for sharing it with us. Now we're up to $100,000 that every JCC needs. 50 grand for their teen workers. 50 grand for their ta for Anybody else want to give me another 50? Can we get to 150? I feel like I'm back at our gala again. Our final speaker for the day, I'm very excited to welcome to the stage because now we're going to figure out how to get all this money. Laura Fredericks is the founder and CEO of The Ask, and she's going to tell us how to make sure the next 100 years are paid for. Thank you. 
I was working with a board, very smart, engaged, diverse people. I walked into the room and they said, you're the one who's going to bring us the cash. You're the one who's going to bring us the revenue. So I said, sure, I can do this. So I go into my typical fundraising is about organization, structure, and focus. But we have to ask for money. And with that, this man jumps up and he says, little lady, and when you hear those words, you're done, you're over, just go home, this is not going to go anywhere. <laughs> little lady, I don't like to ask for money. I don't like to ask, period. I thought, oh, this is wonderful. And now I have all of them, and you know that typical horseshoe formation they have, and everyone's leaning in and staring at you. I thought, what am I going to say? I said, sir, may I ask you a question? Which actually was a great ask, by the way. And he said, sure. I said, well, have you ever in your life asked a family member for help? Have you asked a boss for some money? Have you asked a financial planner to let it stretch just a little bit more for your retirement? And he said, sure. And I said, well, that's an ask. And you do it every day. And you've been doing it for decades. And he said, well, I never thought about it that way. And I said, think about this. Every time in every life, in every decision, it's all about ask. But somehow, when it comes to asking for money, something goes off in our brain, or better yet, we put something in our brain. Don't do it. I'm going to get a no, right? They're not going to like me anymore. My friends aren't going to talk to me anymore. And we go on and on, and the person hasn't even said a word, and we're doing all this assuming. So I said, if you just allow me a little bit, I'm going to show you how we can do this so that you're comfortable with it and so that your organization can thrive for decades to come. So when you think about it, we need to ask, right? We need to ask for a specific amount. We need to ask all the time. Otherwise, we can't do what we need to do for each and every JCC for decades to come. So what I want to do is share with you a couple things. Because when we think about it, asking actually has a king in mind. And it actually has the K, <laughs> which I like a lot, because it's about opportunities. So what I want to do is go and give you the tools that you need to remove what I call money blockers. Because when we come to ask for money, I think it's about money blockers. When you think about the word ask, think about it this way, okay? Number one, share your story. I was working with a group and um, what I like to do is kind of divide them in thirds because with every group there's a, a group that really loves to ask for money and they want to know the next level and then there's a group that kind of wants to know about fundraising but they don't know how to, how, how to do it and there's a third that really wants you to truly go away so what I do with that group is this I sit them down and I say to them you know out of the 1.4 million million nonprofits in this country alone, why are you here? Why are you investing this time? Why do you want this JCC to succeed? Share your story. We go around the room and we do that. And then I'm about to leave and like, whoa, whoa, where are you going? I said, this is fundraising. This is asking. Because you're sharing your story and you're going to ask someone to give their story back. So one of the very, very best things you can do is ask someone to share your story. And so I'm going to give you some things for you to think about is, what is your story? Why are you invested here? Why are you invested in the future? Why do you want volunteers? Why do you want donors to join you in this wonderful effort to raise money? So the first simple thing in asking is, share your story. The second is, uh, think about it in a different way. Think about it as asking needs to be a specific amount and a specific purpose. Because truly, when I've, and I've polled a lot of people that when you say to them, and we've all done this, you know, please increase your gift over last year, that's not an ask. Please consider doing something more than you did last year, that's not an ask. Or my favorite is, here's a sheet of paper, where do you find yourself? And they'll tell you, nowhere on that sheet of paper, thank you. I'm not anywhere, but thanks for asking, right? Seriously, people want to know where you want them to be. 
right? Give them an idea. So every ask has to be a specific amount, a specific purpose. And it's very easy. Laura, we would love for you to consider giving 50,000 for this JCC and this is why. Specific amount, specific purpose. People want to design because if they don't, it simply means it doesn't matter. You're going to go turn around, drive to the next cul-de-sac and ask somebody else for it and I never mattered. You know, asking is about mattering. Asking is about giving a purpose. It's a design. Where do you want me to be? So please don't be afraid of the number. People are looking for the number. So asking is about a specific amount and a specific purpose. And the third tip I have for you is, and here we go, no now does not mean no later. But in our heads, when you hear no, and you will, you will hear no. It's just a fact of life. What goes off in your head is, no, never, go away, close the door, I never want to see you again. And that's what kind of pulls us back in asking, because we don't want to hear those words. We don't want to feel badly, we don't want to be disappointed, and we don't want to be unsuccessful. But no now does not mean no later. And you simply can say, that's fine, and my expression is, life is long, we're going to come back, we're going to um, revisit this, one of my favorite fundraising words. We're going to revisit this later. And if you really keep them up to date on what's going on, the progress you're making, where the money is going, stewarding that well, they'll come back. They will come back. And so when you use the term, we'll circle back with you, we'll keep you close, we'll keep you informed. They have a design now for where you want them to be. No now does not mean no later. And a couple things about the ask. The ask really is a couple things for you to think about. It's a conversation, it's not a confrontation. It's not I talk, you talk, I talk, you talk, like a tennis match, it goes back and forth. It's a conversation, okay? It's an opportunity. My last thing that I wanna leave you with, and this is a guiding principle of mine that I have used for decades. It is Laura's mantra, okay? That is, when you ask for money, you are not taking something away, you are giving an opportunity. When you ask for money, you are not taking away, you're giving opportunities. Opportunities to do well. Opportunities for families now, present, and in the future. That's what asking is about. Shift your mindset. Believe 1,000% in what you're asking for and your success rate will just be off the charts. Just off the charts. Feel good about it. Feel good about your purpose in life. Feel good about your passion point for your JCC. And I challenge you to find out what is that passion point. And once you know it, asking is effortless. Asking should be seamless. Because if you really, really have the essence of what this will do for decades to come, asking is going to be so natural. And so I want to thank you today for being your closer. And what I want to say to you is, may every ask be your best ask, and may your JCC thrive for decades to come. Thank you. Great job. Thank you. Um, Laura, before you leave, I do want to let you know that I would like to specifically ask you for $100,000 so I can send my daughter to the University of Minnesota's Carlson School of Business Management. Did it work? Okay. I got the ask in. It was good. We need to remove our barriers. You know, while Laura was talking to us about removing our barriers to the ask, I think that it's a metaphor to so much more. What are your barriers? How much has the speed of change created speed bumps that became speed humps? So that if you accelerate into them, you have to have your car fixed. We have to remove our barriers. We have to share our stories. We have to not be afraid to ask. So I want to give a huge round of applause to all the great speakers today. I want to, yeah, they were fantastic. Um, I do want to let you know that I, I want to wrap up with one thing. So there's very few questions what the future holds for us. It's the year 2116 and I want to tell you what I think we'll be seeing. We will still be having the leaders who may not be in the room, but because of the legacy commitment they make, 
They will lead the JCCs to be the JCC we want them to be, including the Mandel Center on Mars. A hundred years from now, it's still remotely possible that Alan Mann will be the CEO of JCC Association. And I'm a hundred percent sure that 100 years from today, we will be the welcome mat to our Jewish community. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Mark. As always, you hit it out of the ballpark. And thank you to all of our wonderful speakers. We, we really appreciate this. Just a few announcements. Immediately following this plenary, we have a refreshment break in the Grand Ballroom on Level 3. And there will be coffee. I know you're all asking for coffee, so there will be coffee. Following that, we have our second set of seminars from 11.30 to 12.45, and these include follow-up sessions with our J-talkers, if you'd like to go deeper into their, talk into their topics. <clears throat> we have a conference-wide buffet lunch from 12.45 to 2.15 in the exhibit hall on level three, and it is our last opportunity to visit our vendors. Uh, and at 145, we have our biennial bonanza raffle. You can also pick up your award certificates and have a photo taken with your delegation in the exhibit hall. Uh, <clears throat> Mark Verstegen will have his books available there as well. Please be sure to tell your JCC story at our video booths on level three and four foyers and paint a mural. Thank you very much.